to think about engaging investors um, as a relationship process. Um, um, Now, the first thing you should always think about with investors, I'm just going to mention this very briefly. What's the value for them? Why are they excited? Is your team awesome? Is your technology awesome? Can they make lots of money? That's got to be part of the story. An investment discussion is necessarily a business discussion. And I want everyone to bring that, build that in mind. But with startups, early venture, it's a bit more than that. There's relationships, there's people involved, all of that sort of thing. So make sure you're thinking about what's the value for investors. And we'll unpack that a bit more later. Um, um, I always put this slide up just to remind you that investors are not the only potential source of money for your business. And of course, customers are the best source. Um, grants, cost reduction, R&D tax incentive, um, debt, um, all of those things, bear it in mind. Uh, I won't dwell on any of them, but feel free to ask in the Q&A and we can unpack any of them. And, and, and I know Sylvia and Nick will be happy to talk about some of those other sources of money as well. Um, I'm going to unpack this a little bit more in discussion with Sylvia and Nick. Um, the relationship you have with the investor can be a long-term one and there can be, and the value can accrue over time. Um, and particularly sometimes when you go back to your investors and say, I need a bit more money, if you've got the right relationship and the right pitch to them, that can save your bacon. Um, so that's enough super quick background and introduction from me. I've surfed through that really quickly. Just wanted to say those things. So what I'd like to do now, I'll turn off my slide share. Uh, and, um, and introduce our guests. Now, firstly is Sylvia Tullock, a very experienced business person, uh, IPO'd at least two companies, I think, uh, on lots of company boards, uh, a long-term uh, angel investor, a uh, backer of the Griffin Accelerator program, and uh, frankly, a friend of mine who's been, it's been my co, co my pleasure to co-invest with. Um, uh, Sylvia, is there any one tip or thought that you want to start your contribution with? I'd like, well, two. So, so let me give the two that I've been thinking of, and that is um, unexpectedly, I think one of the great benefits of getting uh, investors on board is, is not just their money, of course, but it's the fact that there's a whole bunch of people who are on your share register who want you to succeed nearly as much as you want to yourself. I've always felt that having a whole bunch of investors, the, the, the sort of the power of having people behind me wanting to invest, and then I feel the same thing when I'm, on, I'm investing in other companies, is that that joint experience of making something successful, no matter what your contribution is, is really empowering. So I think that's a great thing. And the second piece of um, advice on the other side that I always give when I'm mentoring companies is don't take it personally. Investors make their decision. And by the way, that's really hard to, to, to actually take on board. But, but investors have their own reasons for investing. They have their own access to money timing issues. They have the areas of expertise. They have the rules that they've set themselves. They may love you. They may love what you're doing. It does not mean that they're going to invest in you. And you have to learn not to take that personally. Um, so they're my two startups. <laughs> awesome, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Um, I'll bring Nick McNaughton into the conversation. Nick is um, a longtime angel and venture investor. He's run two funds, including ANU Connect Ventures, uh, which has got a number of very successful uh, companies in its portfolio that you that you'd know about. Um, uh, uh, Nick's also, uh, his new business, Campus Plus, is a really dynamic services business targeting uh, the tertiary sector, doing amazing things. Uh, Nick, welcome. 
Thank you, Craig. And I just want to make a clarification. Uh, the, the picture of me on the invite wearing a moon boot, I think uh, Britt was uh, Britt was just having a bit of fun because that picture is from quite a while ago. And I want to reassure all of you that I have nothing wrong with my leg and I'm fine. So uh, just, just telling you that I haven't got a moon boot on at the moment. Um, my two quick tips, Craig, are these. Mm -hmm. You really want to find smart money, not dumb money. And I don't mean to discredit people who have money who are putting uh, um, investment into your business, but you really need to find people who have domain expertise, who have networks, who have industry experience from the um, sector that you're in. Because if you're bringing money in from people who don't have that expertise, you're gonna be spending an enormous amount of time educating that investor about your sector. They're gonna be asking you questions that really aren't aligned with where you are as a business. And it can be very, very distracting and can actually veer your business and the direction of your business away from where where you want to go so really try and find investors who have some domain expertise in in your space and the second um, opening gambit i wanted to say was that you you really have to make sure when you're talking to an investor that you're not just talking to one investor investors like to invest as syndicates and so yes you're talking to person a but you should consider that behind that person, there are probably two, three or four other investors that uh, that individual um, likes to invest alongside. And so if you do a really good job on that pitch, you're not just potentially getting one investor, you may be getting three or four. So I'll leave it at that, Craig. Uh, Nick, I just want to follow up that last, there's so, so much to unpack there. I'll start the last one. Uh, you know, sometimes the best way to get an investor to invest is for them to hear from their colleague. Uh, so when you've got somebody interested, you should always say to that investor, who else would you like to bring into this deal? How, you know, uh, I, you know, who would you like, who do you think, who would you like to introduce me to? Who, who do you think will be relevant for this? Ask questions like that, uh, get, get people in. Um, and find and find the right match, and it's not just. I mean, there's uh, the 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 money that's smart for you might be money that's done for another project, so it's about that right match between your project and the and the broader team, which investors are part of your broader team. Um, Sylvia, I I thought it might be interesting to tell to talk about um, um, a. a a mining project and initially a mining project that you've been involved in for a while. And I, uh, we heard about this from you, from the founder and gradually got a couple of investors more and more interested. And that, that company's changed completely from finding opals to finding high purity alumina uh, two or three pivots later. And that's been a real rich, in, uh, rich interaction between the founder and the investors and the board. Yes, I mean, and, and that does illustrate how important communication is. I mean, if the only time you go to your investment community is when you want money, um, you, you're unlikely to succeed. Um, so, because things change. And, and, and if you've got a good communication going, you can take people along the, the journey with you. So, so that it was actually a sapphire mine, um, right? <laughs> not, Sorry, sapphire, I said it wrong. There you go. So, so I, I was asked by a, a long-term friend and, and somebody I've worked with very often, Mike McCann. Um, he said, listen, Sylvia, I, I, it's, it's almost a hobby. I, I've, got a, I, I've got this some mining lease I, I'm, I'm buying, you know, um, sapphires we're going to be mining in central Queensland. Um, will you come on the, the board and sort of, you know, be part of, part of that? And, and initially it was just to sort of help out really, not to invest, although it soon became an investment as well, which is not all that much. Um, and, uh, I mean, who can knock back a sapphire mine? I mean, really, I can see Holly smiling for one. Um, so, uh, so I did. And, um, and, and, I, and, that, and that was a fascinating journey. We brought along um, a, a number of people in the Canberra community just because it was interesting, to be honest. Some things are not core. I had never thought I invested. In, I would invest in mining. But, um, but interesting, very interesting. And I learned a lot about 
gem marketing because the other person who came along soon after me was Uwe Boucher and he said, oh, he was interested in learning about how to mine. So I said, okay, well, I'll get, the, I'll, I'll learn about the, how you sell gems. I mean, they're the two things you have to do, uh, how, how to make the stuff, how to, how to sell them um, as the directors on the board. And um, so, yeah, I learned a lot about that. And one of the things I learned was actually um, you can make, you can have sapphires, but there's, if there's not a marketplace where you can consciously sell them, it doesn't work as a business. And what we found was that everybody knows the diamond market is constrained. You know, it's run out of out of South Africa, basically. Um, but sapphire, the sapphire market is too, and it's run out of a very shadowy organisation in Thailand, and um, which is done in US dollars. I went to some gem fairs, international, huge international gem fairs, and the way a lot of business was done is through these huge canvas bags full of U US dollars notes. <laughs> It's not where an Australian business can play. And so then we had to say, well, we've got a mine. What else might we do with it if, if it's actually not going to be to, to dig up sapphires and sell them? And sapphire, the chemists among you will know, is alumina, AL203. And um, you can do some really interesting things with very high purity alumina if you can make it. So it's made sense to us. Okay, if, if the carrier material has sapphires in it, it's probably got a lot of this material that we can make high purity lumina, which is the separator material in batteries, for example. So we started on a journey to how can we, A, find out whether we can do it, how can we then commercialise it, and we're at the stage now of building a mini plant and getting some pretty solid um, partnerships in place. So, I mean, taking investors along that journey um, has been, I mean, everybody got it because, because there were just regular communications. And there were, as Nick said, a bunch of people who often invest together and trust each other. And so um, you didn't have to question the honesty, which honestly sometimes people do, of, of, what's, of what you're being told. So, yeah, that was an interesting, interesting invest. And still, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's personality driven. I mean, the, the CEO is, is an absolute great communicator. And that's, that's something you've got to cultivate in yourself. Um, as a, a founder, to be a great community. Yeah, um, with your customers, with your partners, but mm. yeah, in this case, with the investors. Mm. Uh, and you know, I think it's I, I, I sort of I sort of um, tried to get you to talk about that story a little bit because I think um, you know it's important to talk about how we we it's often a case of rescuing or, or reshaping something that didn't necessarily turn out as we thought it would at the beginning. Mm. Uh, and that's something that that really. I still have a hope of getting a great sapphire. <laughs> Didn't you get any? Oh, a couple of small ones, but the really good one went to uh, Uve's wife. Yeah. Anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> the best one. Was there. Never mind. So, so can I just chip in on communication? Please. So I agree with Sylvia. Communication is really, really important. Um, what I've learned through COVID is that Zoom is a fantastic way of communicating with your investors. And you need to, at the very beginning, as a founder, define what the cadence is. What is the cadence of acceptable communication with your investor group? Um, some of you may have a small number of investors, five or six. Some of you may have 10. Some of you may have even more than that. And the more investors you have on your share register, the more time consuming it becomes for you because they all want to know what's going on. So I always think you need to write into your shareholders agreement what is an acceptable level of communication. And typically I, as an angel investor, expect to get a report once a quarter and uh, having a report that goes out uh, you know, via PDF and email to everybody is a really good way of updating everybody. What, I, what I've liked about COVID is that you can substantiate that with a um, one hour Zoom call once a quarter so you send your quarterly report out and then three days later you convene a you know 4, 4 p.m 4 30 5 p.m call for all of your shareholders where you basically reiterate what you've said in the report so uh, often the mistake that i see founders make is that they write everything in the shareholder report and they expect the investors to have read it they won't have read it right so they may have skim read it um, but you should, in your pitch to them when you're communicating, just hit the headlines of what you've done in that previous quarter. 
things that have gone well, things that haven't gone well, things that you're remediating on and things that you're going to do next quarter. And having the discipline to do that quarterly report and call really builds trust with your investors. It tells them that you're willing to share bad news. You know how to course correct. You know how to problem solve. You know how to seek advice and consultation, but you're not hiding anything. Okay. Uh, totally. over, over to you, Craig. Oh, no, I just I want to follow that up. And, and one particular thing I'd like to just focus in on a bit more is bad news. There's a real tendency when, when this, you've had a bit of a setback. And what I see is entrepreneurs uh, say the following. Oh, look, I'll send that report after I've fixed the problem. And then I can send some good news. And that way you just, and, and next thing you know, we've got out of that cycle of communication. So Nick, as an investor and Sylvia, what, when you get bad news in, a, in an investor update, what do, you, what do you think? What do you do? Do you want to get bad news? Would you rather know about it? Oh, absolutely rather know about it. Uh, apart from anything else, uh, certainly in the early years of angel investment is um, you've got a, a resource to draw upon. So, and I consider myself part of that resource. So if there's bad news, and if I if, if it's something I can help with, make an introduction, make a suggestion, whatever, then I then I'm there. So in many ways, the, the, the saying, here's the bad news, has it can anybody do X, Y, or Z for me, or you know, or in any way help? I mean, it's uh, to not tell people, just denies yourself that access. It, it breaks trust as well, Sylvia. If you if you, oh, if, you yeah. if you if you hold back bad news or you obfuscate how bad the bad news is, it it destroys trust. And trust is one of the the most fragile things that you have with your investors. And I'll I'll tell a story um, shortly about that. But um, just to follow on from this, I think uh, it's okay to have bad news, but don't come to an investor group and not have one, two or three solutions, right? So um, we're, we're trusting in you as the leader of this business and you need to have thought through what the problem is and thought through what potential solutions are and test those, as Sylvia said, with your investor group. So I don't want you to come to me and say, we've got this terrible problem. And then I say, well, what do, what do you recommend we do? And you say, I don't know. That, that isn't how you do this. You, you basically come up with three options, you know, Option A has this pros and cons, option B pros and cons, option three, and then open it up to your investor group to say, what do you think? And one of your investors may come up with option four, which is fine, but um, we expect you to be sophisticated enough to come up with uh, some answers. Did you say you were going to tell a story as well, Nick? Okay, I'll tell you. So this is part of my, uh, um, my um, confessions of an angel investor talk that I think Sylvia you were in a few years ago um, I'm not going to name names but um, an angel an angel um, deal that I did oh, it's more than 10 years ago where I backed a founder a very very charismatic founder and uh, they were doing a top-up raise and that top-up raise was largely funded by me and my wife and uh, the deal closed on a Thursday and uh, in the old days when we could go and visit people, I used to drop in on my portfolio companies at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning because I wanted to see whose car was in the car park and uh, 5 p.m. on Friday to, again, see whose car was still in the car park. Anyway, I turned up on, uh, you know, the following week and saw a secondhand BMW that was parked in the car park that I hadn't seen before. And so I walked into the office and had the update from the founder and then said, who's, who's is the second-hand BMW? And the founder said, oh, that's mine. And I said, oh, when, when did you get that? He said, oh, I bought it over the weekend. And I said, well, where did you get the money for that from? And he said, well, <laughs> I rewarded myself for closing the recent round, so I bought it from that money. <laughs> and uh, at that moment, my trust with that founder was completely broken and destroyed. And I, I literally went from, I can't trust this person. I'm never going to put any more money in. And um, it destroyed that relationship it, to, to this day, that, 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 that relationship is destroyed. I hope you can all understand why that's unacceptable behavior. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, what you've got to accept. I mean, if, if there's a decision to make. Am I going to raise money or not? Um, because there are ways to develop businesses without taking other shareholders in. And some people's personalities are better suited doing that. Some business opportunities are better suited to doing that. 
But once, but once you have decided that you're going to take other people's money, you have to continually remember you're the custodian of other people's money. I've got a, a very similar story, Nick, which is very early on. I, it was a public company board, <laughs> and a better, better, you know, emerging company board. And the, um, the MD sort of in one of the first or second board meeting came apparently to um, his, his two fellow, but I wasn't on the board thing at that point, I came on later. Um, and said, um, I, I bought myself this, this gold, gold plated, gold plated pen, um, because you know we've we've done our IPO and it was successful and all. And um, my, my colleague said to him, Oh, you can't do that. You know, this is this is not what the money was for. The next time she turned up to the board meeting, he had one for her too. He said, Never mind, there's one for you too. <laughs> it did. It did. Problem. And and that company went under. Yeah. It wasn't just that they broke that kind that level of trust. Was I mean, it, should, but it wasn't that. It, it went under because that attitude just doesn't take you where you have to go. It, it's no. the custodian of other people's money. Um, and and and, yeah, and it's in, in the angel scene. It's people who know things can fail. I mean, and 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 can be okay with you with it failing if you've given it your, if, if you've given it your best shot and you know what and. Luck has turned against you. I'm a huge believer in luck, both good and bad. But um, but you have to never forget it's other people's money. And yeah, your- and you have to behave with integrity, Sylvia, yeah. all the way through. You know, honesty yes. and integrity are two yes. attributes that are, are fundamental for you. Um, yes. Craig, if you don't mind, I just want to throw in another another okay. point to move this along. So. Um, when, you, when you're starting to go and talk to investors, I think it's really important that you don't judge a book by its cover. So um, you may be introduced to an investor, you know nothing about them. Uh, they may turn up in, in a hoodie, in a Zoom, you know, not, not looking particularly flash, but do not ever judge a book by its cover. So some of the wealthiest people that, uh, that I've ever interacted with you wouldn't think that they were wealthy. And, and uh, you know, in fact, uh, Serena's made a comment in the chat about uh, people who make themselves look wealthy who aren't actually wealthy. I, I've, I believe that if someone looks too too smart and too sharp, they're probably hiding something. That, that That's my view on things. And so you need to just not use, you know, have a prejudice around uh, how someone looks as to whether they're going to invest $20,000, $100,000 or $250,000. You, you never know. So here's some hints and tips how you qualify someone. And you as, uh, as founders, don't just be on the end of questions from the investors. It's, a, it's an equation, you know, you, you, it's a balance. And I like um, founders who actually challenge me. And I'm gonna give you two questions that are really useful for qualifying investors. So when you're talking to an investor, you should ask them this question. How many deals have you done in the last two years? Okay, write, write that down. If you, if you haven't got that, write that down. How many deals have you done in the last two years? What is really good about that question is, first of all, if they're a rookie investor and they've done no deals, they'll be spluttering because they haven't got anything to say. And if they say, oh, I can't tell you that, you know that they're hiding something and they're not a sophisticated, qualified investor that you, you have. And if they say, well, I've done two deals in the last uh, last two years or three deals in the last two years, you can say to them to qualify that even further. Oh, did you put in 50, 100 or 250 K? And so you're setting the expectation of what the money in that you want. You don't you don't want ten thousand dollars. You, you, you want you know, a small number of higher value investors. So these two questions help you qualify the investors. And if you want to push your luck even further, the third thing you can say is, would you be okay if I interviewed the CEOs of those two or three companies? So you can actually um, reference check the the investor um, by talking to the founders of those companies. Those three questions are really good qualifying questions for founders. And I'll stop there and hand back to you, Craig. Uh, really good and, and a reference checking it's a thing you should reference check people you should re- if you're employing somebody talk talk to their references same thing with uh, 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 other people you might be doing business with try and talk to people they've done business with um, it's a thing um, by the way and you can just look up you can look up people's right. 
LinkedIn profiles and you can even say, oh, I see you're a, you're a director of X. Yep. You know, how's that? I mean, it, 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 it can be, Nick, Nick is very able to put things very upfront. Not, not everybody is as able to do that, but there are ways around it um, to still find out about people because, um, you know, bad money in an investment can destroy a company. Yeah, uh, and when you're, you're in, when you're in that need, needing to raise money, but but bad money can really destroy it because it brings with it a bad in, a bad investor who can yeah, cause and, trouble. To be honest. Um, and one of your investors, you can ask them about another potential new investor. What do you know about this person? Perfect. Absolutely ask. Absolutely yeah. ask. And LinkedIn's yeah. fantastic because it reveals all the people that they're connected to that you're mm. connected to, and so. <laughs> You know, without actually asking them for names, you can go and uh, subtly have some conversations with third parties that are connected to that individual to reference check them as well. So make yes. sure, you know, you don't just let, let the investor asking you lots of questions. You have to qualify the investor too. Yeah. And that um, can help that conversation with them because finding out about them opens up the conversation and a, a conversation can, builds the trust and, and the rapport as well. Um, I mean, one of the things we haven't said yet is, is that it's very unusual for you to meet somebody and, and then, the, then invest. I mean, this is a long journey often, and, it's, and it is a journey that's interlinked, the whole networking. It's why Seabrin is so helpful because, you know, knowing people who know people uh, and, and seeing people regularly at networking events um, builds up that background the point where an investment decision or an investment conversation is so much easier. Um, it, it used, I mean, it, it used to be you had to be, you know, almost in, the, well, what, the, what did they used to call it? The, the public school boys network, et cetera, because that was the people who knew people who knew people. Now we've, we've come up with a much more egalitarian systems these days um, than it used to be. And, and that's great, but you still have to take advantage of it. And, and you have to know that, I mean, that they say, what are they saying? Selling, you, you know, talk to people seven times before they buy anything. Investors, it's exactly the same. And it's not, it's really just the trust thing. Because if you just meet somebody instantly, do you trust what they say, what they're selling, what, what they're asking you to invest in? If over a period of months and even a couple of years and, and you know people and the interaction, then that can build up to a point where, where the, and, and the other thing you've got to get over sometimes, some, some people I meant or say, I don't like to ask. I don't like to ask people. I especially don't like to ask people I know. I mean, it's okay to pitch, but ask people I know or my family or my friends or whatever. And, and I say to them this, they will not thank you if you are very successful and you never suggested to them that they could invest in you. They will not thank yeah. you at all. No, and a, and a good subtle way of doing that, uh, um, Sylvia, is because I have quite strong views about taking money from family, but um, rather than asking them for money, you can say, do you know anybody who might be interested in investing in my business? So you're not saying to them directly invest in my business, but you're subtly saying, do you know anybody? And then they're making the decision, actually, I do want to invest in your business. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll make this comment about family. You know, family is with you till death do you part. And so if you have raised money from Auntie Sue or Uncle Fred and the business goes bad, um, they'll never let you forget it. So you have to think of the emotional um, challenges over life as you go through having a familial relationship where you've lost money. So I actually think it's better to, to not take money from family so that you, you're not encumbered like that. So that's my point on that. But the tricky then if you're really successful and, and you know, if you haven't offered them the opportunity, Nick, it is this tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, Good point. I, I generally don't want, to, want you to take money from anyone who can't afford to lose it. That's the important action. Uh, yes, I, I totally can, agree, because, Craig. Because it's risky and, and you know, there's people if they put in, uh, only Sue puts $10,000 into your business and that was really an important part of her retirement savings. Uh, no, please don't do that. Um, Uncle Fred um, has, has got a big, rich uh, APS super and he's sort of happy and 
but you know, then maybe, maybe. Uh, so make sure you and make sure you understand your uh, investor's capacity to lose money. And the other reason for that, in general, is an investor who can't afford to lose their money on their deal will support you really strong, which is sort of a plus. But if it's going bad, it gets ugly because they really can't afford to lose that money and there's so much pressure. You actually yeah. want somebody who's much more fundamentally on your side. Yeah. Look, in the chat now, Sheen has, uh, has asked a question, yeah. how do you classify a bad investor? And it's difficult right. to know. Yes. Unless, unless you've invested with somebody before, how do you know? You want to avoid narcissists, okay? So um, avoid narcissists at all costs because they are um, sociopaths. They, um, you know, they they um, they drag you left, they drag you right, they they make you do lots of work, and then they've forgotten about the issue the next day. It's incredibly dis distracting. So, try to avoid narcissists if you can. Um, try to avoid litigators. So, if somebody has a reputation around the traps that they, you know, they litigate, or you know, they they they're quite happy sending out legal threats you don't need that either so now sheen those are two two attributes yeah. that you want to avoid can i, can I yeah. just give you my quick answer and i'll go to sylvia how do you classify a bad investor i think is almost exactly the same question as how do you classify a bad person uh, mm. and if the, and by the way a person who's bad for you might not be bad for me but the, the people who you don't agree with their values their integrity doesn't line up with you their views you know you've got to, you've got to see them as a good person that's for me is what i would be looking for sylvia i'm going to say something a little bit controversial mm -hmm. really careful dealing with people who are lawyers and and i and that's and you know that one of my very favorite co-investors is one so so there are great ones <laughs> but, but um but I'm very careful. And, and I think it's this. I think it's that they get kids at 18 and, and teach them about that there's and this adversarial system that is our law. And um, I think that's probably, so yeah, I am, it's, so it's interesting. That's just for me, but I'm really careful if I'm dealing with somebody, with somebody who's a lawyer. Totally. Manjula asked another good question on the chat. Is it acceptable to talk to an, a founder who's received money from a particular investor about their experience? Absolutely. 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 Yes. Why not, Manjula? Yeah. Don't be shy. Now that, yeah. that entrepreneur might, you might watch to see if they're self-censoring or something like that, but ask, how did you go with this investor who I'm talking to as well? Uh, what you're looking for is, oh, I just so love working with this person, right? Mm. Um, but, you know, they might say, well, they're a bit challenging on this topic or that topic. Now you can take it into account. And I think that really you should do that. I would certainly encourage you in it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I encourage any people that I'm mentoring to, to talk to other founders as much as they can on every topic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and how, how, how do you get a grant? How do you get an AC grant? How, 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 how do you feel about your R&D tax grant? How, the whole lot, because, I mean, one thing for Nick and Craig and I to be advising, and Craig's very much the cold face I know, but other people who are in the same position at the same time as you, there's something special about what you can share with each other. And, and, and experience with investors is right at the top of that. I just want to add to Harold's comment. He said, you've got to be careful of accountants too. And <laughs> I tend to agree with that, Harold. You know, accountants are nothing more than scribes, in my opinion, um, but they have this poor, low self-esteem. And so they, they believe that they've got good strategic brains and start giving you business advice. Don't take business advice from accountants, honestly, because, uh, um, you know, they're, they're there making money just because they're doing your books. They're, they're not uh, strategic advisors necessarily. Back to you, Craig. Well, I, I, I'm going to say it's slightly less controversial. Try and understand who you're dealing with and what they bring. Um, and, and the better you can understand their mindset coming in, their pre their, their previous experiences, the better you can find the right relationship with them, or discover it's not the right real, or don't don't go to don't go down that path. Uh, but try to understand your stakeholders in a general manner, not just investors. Um, Nick, Sylvia, how does is how is this different in a COVID world with lockdowns and that sort of thing? Is does that really change anything? You want to go, Sylvia? No, you go first. I'll think about okay. it. Okay. Um, 
I don't think so, Craig. I think that you don't have the opportunity to personally interact with people, but the process of finding an investor syndicate is exactly the same that you would go through if you were doing it in person rather than online. The important thing is that you've identified a well-credentialed initial target. And um, as you know, I'm a great believer of LinkedIn for finding people who are really, really good and well credentialed. And I run my workshop, you know, Investor Finder. And many of you have been through that workshop where we've found somebody somewhere in the world that, that might be interested in, in your business. The same process that you'll go through, whether you do it in person, is exactly the same in COVID. You're just doing it remotely. You'll have a Dropbox repository. You'll be signing NDAs virtually. You'll be um, submitting slide decks and IMs virtually virtually rather than doing it necessarily in person. So no, actually, I think COVID has optimized your time. I think it's made it more efficient and more productive for you to get an investor syndicate together virtually rather than in person. Mm. Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, it, so, so that I agree. I mean, personally, I, I really miss doing things in person. <laughs> the, the, the energy that you get from other people is, is something that's quite different. Um, so I, I miss that, but but I have to say that the various companies that I'm I'm involved with that are raising money at the moment have actually found it very efficient. Um, and part of it is that where where it might have been reasonably hard to make people meet you in person, it, it is I think a bit easier to do it via Zoom. Uh, and perhaps that's because it's not as big a commitment for people. I don't know, but. Um, I, early on in COVID, I, I said, and I've worked so far into it now, I'm not sure it still applies, but I think that people's risk profile change. Well, you know, once you stared down a pandemic, then um, people were freer, I think, in terms of making risky, understanding that it was okay to make a risky investment. So I actually think it was easier to raise money um, during COVID, certainly in the, in the first year or so of it. Um, um, than the yeah. normal circumstances. Sylvia, I looked, I'm a bit of a, a history buff, and I went back and looked at the last pandemic. And in 1922, the 20s were the most innovative, socially progressive and advanced decade of the last uh, century. And I'm predicting that the same thing will happen now. We've all, this is our war, you know, let's be clear, our generation's war, this is it. And we're getting to the end of the war, thankfully. And uh, people's um, belief in, um, you know, an unencumbered life or, a, or a, a completely safe life, they've been shattered. Many of us will know people who've died. My, one of my brothers died of COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, we suddenly realised that we're not invincible. And so we're learning to trust science. We're learning that we can solve some of society's greatest problems. We're learning that we can um, create technologies that help humanity. And that's what you all are, your founders, your, your entrepreneurs, your people who want to change the world. So I think there's going to be a golden decade of entrepreneurship, to be honest. Yeah, awesome. I, I want to chip in one thing that I think is a little bit different in the, um, in the Zoom COVID world is you can, it, it, it actually is a little easier to sometimes have that first half hour Zoom call with somebody. Um, but you, you, you do need to be more organised and systematic about the follow-up than, than sometimes happens when there's in-person interactions and it sort of happens a bit more naturally. Uh, and it's very often that you don't close someone on the first conversation, most typical. Uh, and sometimes they like to uh, watch your progress over six months and get more and more to know about what you're doing and um, get more and more interested in in the in the uh, what you're doing, um, uh, and so really make sure you be quite in this environment, be quite intentional about following up. And and if somebody says, "Oh, maybe not now," could I give you an update in three months? Just tell them. Just tell them how you're going on. Um, um, and that that can be super powerful when you follow that up, and you must. Follow that up. So that's another tip I want to give people. If you if it's not going super well at first, that's not your that's not sort of time to give up. That's time to just keep keep chipping away. So maybe to add from that, Craig, part of your communication is you've got your share 
existing mm -hmm. investor based communication, which has all the secret stuff and the inside stuff, the good, the bad and the ugly. And then you've got your general quarterly report that uh, goes to your watch list of investors and you keep touching them every 90 days, they're getting an, a, a PDF, three, four page PDF as to how the business uh, metrics are, are performing and how you're doing. That doesn't have the bad news. It's got a more optimistic spin on it. And it keeps getting your name in front of the investor base. And then as part of, you know, newsletter three, you can say, well, now we're doing either a top up raise or we're doing our series A or we're doing a pre, um, you know, pre series A um, convertible note. And you've now got a target list of people that have been watching you for six months, nine months, 12 months. Much easier, as Craig said, to have a, a more sophisticated and deeper conversation with them because they've been um, going on the journey with you. Totally. Um, uh, and, Daniel, and part of that journey, like, part of that communication is saying, this is what I'm planning to do, and then showing that most of the time, at least, you do it. <laughs> or you did three quarters of it, or you did some bits, and there was a good reason why another bit didn't work. So there's a story about it. Yeah. Uh, Daniel's asked, asked on the chat, I think this is a really good question. If you're a sole founder, what can you do to give comfort to your investor? Um, what do investors think about um, sole founders? I've got a view, but I'll go for you first. I'm, I'm not a great fan of sole founders. Sorry, Daniel. Um, I see key person risk there. And again, those people who've been through my workshops know that I think there's two um, um, personas. There's the technical God. I don't know whether you're the technical God, Daniel. And then there's the sales God. It's very rare that the technical God and the sales God are in the single individual. And if you're working on the product, you can't be selling. If you're selling, you can't be working on the product. So um, I like to see a duo, a dynamic duo, the tech god and the sales god. Sylvia? Um, if, if there's a single person, I think there has to be, you have to believe in the commitment to, to build the team. Because I mean, the single thing, it, it, it's a very short time frame, the single, single person being okay. Um, so... Um, and I don't know that actually putting in money without there being that it's that starting to happen makes makes sense. Different um, if different investors will want to get in earlier or 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 a little more progressed on a project. Um, the ones who are more comfortable getting in earlier more likely to take a risk on you can build the team, and yeah. those who want to de-risk that a little bit are going to want to see you creating evidence of building a team uh, one tactic i'll throw in on that is sometimes you um, don't have the money to build a team you just can't pay those people but if you're in a position where you can say to an investor uh named people named high quality people uh, are, are talking to me and are interested in joining the team when we've got the resources or as we ramp up i think that you can do things like that to sort of shape right. that conversation to demonstrate there's going to be a team and that you're committed because by the way not everybody can form a team either i mean i've got a one particular investor that person after person coming in and going out um it's uh you've got to be able to let go some of what you do and get other people to do it uh, but that's no great sign for the success of that project, is it, Sylvia? No, it's, it's, no, it's absolutely not. It, it's, it means it's going to fail because actually you can't do everything. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, that commitment to the team, I think for me, is more important than yep. it being two people. But that everybody's different. So, please, more questions from the chat. I really want to make sure we bring in lots of people's um, own questions here. Uh, are there more questions on the chat that I missed? Uh, I'll just looking at the chat, Irene has reminded everyone that uh, Nick will be running together with us a re, a two, uh, two advanced workshops on finding investors and negotiating terms with investors. Um, I think sometime in November, um, we'll get into a lot more detail with that. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. I, I see a couple of faces on the call already who've done these, and I think you'll agree that they were fun and informative. Um, and they're via Zoom, Craig, so um, everybody can participate. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, Serena. You enjoyed it. Um, um, Harold's asked, how do you deal with rejection by an investor? Well, I mean, I think that comes back to, to right at the very beginning, talking to someone like me who says to you, don't take it personally. Because yeah. um, you, you just can't know. I mean, it could, 
an investor can be the perfect investor for you and they've actually they've spent they've put all of their investment budget out last week and it doesn't matter what you do they can't do anything um that happens often um yeah. and um so and then, then there's others who are just you know i own this is what i know and this is all i invest in and i used to be much more that way than i am now um but i totally understand it you know this is what you're doing is fascinating but i don't have the knowledge to be part of it for example or i've just set myself some inner rules that i'm not going to invest in that kind of business um yeah. So I mean, it's just right up front. You have to you have to know that that that's the truth and convince yourself of it, and don't take it personally. And and Harold, I think if you ask them, you know, is it a timing issue? Is it a uh, you know what is the issue? So so um, Sylvia's very clearly explained. There's all sorts of reasons, but why an investor might say no. Um, you can just go back to them and said, is it okay if I put you on our quarterly newsletter? And because of human nature, we don't like to, you know, just put bury you as, and stamp on your head at the same time. They'll say, of course, put me on the on the newsletter. So you're on the newsletter. And uh, um, one investment that I did, I said no to this founder eight times, literally eight times. And she was so persistent. She was probably Australia's most successful fundraiser. It's a shame she wasn't so good at running a business, but but she was a very successful fundraiser. And uh, you know, she just didn't let me go. She she was she was relentless and uh, made it her mission to take that money out of my pocket. And all credit to her, but um, we didn't succeed on that one. A great question. More questions, and I'll just throw in. I prefer not to use words like rejection. Uh, it's it's not a rejection. It's we didn't find the right match, and it's the right match between the right investor and the right opportunity. And you're searching for that match, and I don't want you to see those no's as rejection. Um, and in, and in fact, Craig, you know you should listen very carefully to why they're saying no because it might be a weakness in your story or your pitch or your business, and you 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 learn the. The best lessons in life are from your worst experiences. So uh, listen very carefully when someone says no to you. Totally. And you, you, you try and learn from that. Doesn't mean you will necessarily agree that they've said a truthful fact about your business, but you've heard how they perceived it. And that's absolutely valuable. Um, uh, somebody asked Nashim how to become an investor if you do have money. Um, club together with other investors is my number one advice and, and, and try and make an investment where you co-invest with a more experienced investor and you'll learn a lot. And that's an advice I've, I've taken myself and got lots of and seen it work quite well. And I think adding on to this now, Sheen, if you wanted to, you could um, join an angel investment group like Sydney Angels. Um, I think it's an $800 annual membership fee, but consider it part of your education. Um, what it gives you is access to deal flow, access to meetings, access to pitches. And the lesson I always say to an investor is don't back the first deal you see. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's like going to the casino. Oh, I've got to, got to place a bet. If I haven't got a bet, I'm not in the game. Don't please don't do that um, because you've got to see lots of deals to start to understand what a good deal looks like. So um, over the years, I've got to a point where I'm only investing in one in a hundred things that I look at. So, uh, you know, you've really got to look at lots of things. And then when you see that that genius entrepreneur with a fantastic idea, you know, that's the one to put your chips on. But also, though, combined with that is is don't plan on don't think of it being one or two investments that are going to you know make a lot of money um yeah. each i mean i think i went into it thinking at least half a dozen if you're going to do this you've got to spread your risk and, and also now she you you need to have a number of things you need to have paid off your house you should not be investing angel investment money unless you've paid off your house so objective number one is pay off your house objective number two get an investment property and make sure that's uh, covering itself third have a listed share portfolio that is balanced make sure your um, super fund is well paid for make sure you've got money for your kids education you should not be looking at angel investment until you've done all of those things first because it's a risk it's a risky asset it's client. highly risky 
Um, uh, Harold, very quickly, Capital Angels is still running. I spoke recently to Dominic, the chair of Capital Angels. Uh, he, he told me it was his goal to do an in-person event four weeks after we, we get a clear site that that's allowed. Um, there's been a bit of a gap in activity of Capital Angels, which is a pity. Um, there are other angel groups. And come into the Canberra Innovation Network, we can often talk to you about uh, investment stuff. Um, uh, Matthew's asked on the um, on the chat, uh, how, can you raise capital to go from an idea to a product, you know, to get someone to invest before something's been built? Um, I, before I get your answers, uh, Sylvia and Nick, uh, one part of filling that money gap in can be grant funding, including the Innovation Connect grant that we administer here, which is ACT government money, but there are other grants out there. So remember grant funding, but Nick, Sylvia, do you want to comment on that from an investor point of view? Almost impossible. I don't do it. No. Um, there has to be some indicator that it's going to work. Um, and, and to get an indication it's going to work it's, it's got to you've, you've got to have built something that you that the investor can evaluate, or you've got to have some sort of something that you can show to customers that they can respond to. Um, this, yeah, this because to be honest, an idea is uh, it's it's pretty easy to come up with an idea. <laughs> that when you go when you talk when you're dealing with lots of smart people, which we do in our in you know in the Canberra Innovation Community, there's lots of smart people, uh, and and anybody. Any one of them will have lots of good ideas. Um, no, I'm, it's um, no. I'm going to be slightly more optimistic than Nick and Sylvia, and I'm going to encourage you to find ways to make various sorts of projects that start to prove out an opportunity and show more substance to this. Um, but you will need more than a slide deck. Uh, but you can sometimes do little things. You can engage with customers. You can do other things to build up. Yeah. Uh, your plans, uh, you can make a bit of progress. Irene has said on the chat, sometimes you can get students to do work for you for free as part of their course um, uh, to, to do some building. So these are, these are this, this is sort of part of the big barrier to, one of the big barriers is to get past these real blockages, which is how do we actually create some substance that people can see has more potential than that. Um, but I think that's saying the same thing, Craig. You've got to take it to a point where it has substance. Yeah, totally. There's um, various ways that cost money or that don't cost money that you can do that, but you have to do that. Totally, totally. Um, Nick has said, um, feel free to connect with him on LinkedIn and have a chat. Feel free to come, as everyone I think knows, to uh, the Canberra Innovation Network, have an intro meeting with the team. Um, reach out, be active. It will pay you off. Um, we're nearly out of time. So any last questions? Um, I've, I've, I'm going to quickly pitch in that gap. Um, on Thursday, we've got uh, a really interesting fireside chat with Elaine Stead. Elaine is currently head of new ventures at the ANU, but she's got a track record running a venture fund um, um, and investing in and helping with lots of technology startups. A really interesting journey, including some tough times being sued and stuff like that. Uh, it will be very interesting. So come along and hear. And, and, and I want you as part of that to, um, to learn, but also see the, 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 what I sometimes call the warts and all view of things. It's as, as Sylvia and Nick have I hopefully showed you a bit of it's not necessarily just a simple pathway. Find an investor, got lots of money, big success. Um, <laughs> no. I wish it was. I wish it's it was. not. It's not. Although, Craig, I'll just share with everybody that there's never been a better time to raise money. So mm. never in the history of Australian startups has there been a better time to raise money. Uh, there's more money in angel investment. There's angel investment groups across the country. We've gone from one venture fund in 2005 to over 200 
venture funds in Australia now. So um, all of you should have the confidence that if you keep on educating yourself on how to raise money, you will do it. Um, but you need to make sure you've got a good pitch deck, a good idea, you've got an information memorandum. And when you start talking to investors, you better be ready to send the, the slide deck, the non-disclosure agreement, the information memorandum straight away. So make sure you get ready to start talking to investors. Um, start easy, start close, start local, and then explore widely. And sometimes the right investor for your project is, is not an obvious one like a Sydney Angels or, or uh, a new Connect Ventures. It's, it's just some person, high net worth individual from your sector or got some other reason they've got a connection to you and your project. Um, Luke, we're nearly out of time. So thank you very much, everybody, for being on the call, for listening to us. Uh, thank you, especially uh, Sylvia and Nick. It's so, it's so, uh, I so much appreciate you sharing so openly your experiences in this area and being willing to be part of the community and talk about it. Uh, I, as always, I encourage everyone here, all entrepreneurs, to support each other, be active in the community. Um, and that's what will create the best circumstance for more and more of your innovations to succeed in a way that will generate investors great returns. And I want some of those investors to make lots of money on you and I'll be hitting them up to invest in more things in the Canberra community. Um, so yeah, look, any, unless there's any last thoughts from anyone, well, good. Thank you very much. And uh, see you all on Thursday with Elaine Stead, which will be awesome. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nick, Sylvia.